Dr. Lara Hockman is a family medicine physician and advocate for fellow doctors' well-being amidst rising burnout and dissatisfaction. No, this is not another podcast about burnout. We're going to be talking about finding a practice you'll love, and on the other side of that, being the practice that other physicians will want to join and never leave. She founded Happy Day Health, a boutique physician matchmaking agency to match doctors with well-run physician-owned practices where they can have a voice and enjoy practicing medicine again. She gives us the perspective of both the practice owner and job applicant. What changes have the biggest return on investment to helping hire and retain physician employees and partners? And on the flip side, as an applicant, how do we know which practice is going to be the best match and why do physicians leave their practices? Welcome to the Physician's Guide to Doctoring, a practical guide for practicing physicians. Dr. Bradley Block interviews experts in and out of medicine to find out everything we should have been learning while we were memorizing Krebs cycle. The ideas expressed on this podcast are those of the interviewer and interviewee and do not represent those of their respective employers. And now, here's Dr. Bradley Block. Dr. Lara Hockman, thanks so much for being on the podcast. Thank you for having me. Long time listener, first time caller. (laughs) So what's your origin story? How did you end up getting into, what is it you called it? Medical matchmaking. Yeah, I got into this. I actually fell into it. So I was helping friends find practices that they really enjoyed and helping colleagues and helping practices find physicians. This is because, you know, it's very hard for private practices to find doctors. And a lot of the friends that I was helping them, they were very unhappy. They were in large hospital systems or other big corporations where they didn't have autonomy. And once I helped them find a better place to work, they became happier and were able to enjoy their lives again. And so I had been pondering how I can be a part of the solution to what we're seeing in healthcare. I saw it with my own eyes, how I can help. And so decided if I can just help to start off one physician at a time, help them find a place that they can be happier. That's how I can do my part to help doctors. You refer to it as medical matchmaking. Just to clear up the confusion that our audience (laughs) might have, right? Career consultant. What are some of the other terms that people might use for what it is you do? So the way I earn a living is what a lot of people would call recruiting. It's similar. So yes, I help match doctors with private practices. Really, it's with a physician advocacy bend, making sure that doctors are in the right practices, making sure they're not in situations that they would readily burn out. So you work exclusively with private practices. You're not working with large institutions, hospital systems, academia. Right. Just the small private practices. Okay. Is there a reason for that? There is a reason. Private practices are five times more likely to have no burnout than the big hospital systems. I believe that when physicians are at the helm leading in medicine, then we're the people that care. And so we're the people that tend to put ourselves and patients and our employees first. Of course, our businesses should be profitable, but we should never put our patients' health or happiness at the expense of profit. Yeah, the way I think about it is, I'm in private practice, we're playing the long game, right? We're building relationships in our communities. We're not looking at quarterly reports and seeing what can be done differently over the next quarter or two. Mm -hmm. And so if there's something that's happening that might end up burning bridges in your community, that's a huge problem, even if it's not reflected in the quarterly report. Exactly. And if you're a physician and you're running the practice, you're going to be experiencing the same issues that your employees are experiencing. And if it's bugging them, it's probably bugging you too. That's why I always try to push people into my practice where this is not a practice sponsored podcast, but I'm a partner there and I'm drinking the Kool-Aid. We are the biggest ENT practice in the country and we are physician owned, physician run. And the physicians that are on the board that run the practice are seeing patients full-time just like the rest of us, right? So if there's something that's painful for them. So the larger institution, they just need to make it just not painful enough for you to leave, but they're not trying to help you live your best life. Whereas when they're in the trenches with us, the people that run the practice, they want to live their best lives. So there's parallel interest there. 
exactly what's best for you and what's best for the practice is what's best for all the doctors in the practice. Okay. So as a private practice, what can I do to make myself as desirable as possible to a candidate other than work very little, take no call and make tons of money? (laughs) Well, you got it. So, you know, the first thing that candidates look for is salary and benefits. That's number one. This is where sometimes practices struggle to compete with the hospital systems. So in the surgical specialties, it's not quite as drastic of a difference, but in some of the primary care or other types of specialties where you don't have the entire hospital system to support you, you're not a loss leader for the practice, you have to get creative and think about the other reasons why someone would join your practice. So you and I, as advocates of private practice, we know that the benefit of private practice is having a voice and having autonomy. But a lot of doctors actually don't know that. And a lot of the younger doctors who are coming out of training in the big systems and then have only ever worked in the big systems, they don't even know what they're missing. They have no idea how great it is. So the ways that you want to really attract them is you want to attract them with things like quality of life, whether that's hours, is it a scribe? You know, if you're paying There's companies that outsource their scribes for $8 an hour. That alone can attract. Oh, I'll tell you about that one. (laughs) I see your facial expression. Yes, that sounds like a game changer. Exactly. There's so many things you can do to really help. You know, if you can get a physician a scribe, if you can get an on-call service so that they're not answering calls all night, but there's someone to screen the calls because we all know what it feels like to get a call at 2 a.m. because someone's been constipated for a week. That's not fun. So those quality of life things, those are how you can attract the people. Well, that's when it's bothering them, right? In the middle (laughs) of the night. They're like, oh, waking up in the morning and they still can't poop. They're like, oh, this is an emergency. (laughs) I need to talk to the doctor. What else are you going to do to it? Yeah. They just assume that we're just sitting there trying (laughs) to poop also. They don't know what we're doing. Well, they know we're working all night. So those are other things. A lot of doctors and not all, but a lot are really attracted by growth opportunities Offering partnership is a big way to attract physicians because you can't really become partner in a practice if you're working for the hospital. There's other types of leadership opportunities in the hospital, which are great. But if you're wanting someone to be a partner, that's a nice way to attract them. Another thing that my practice got exactly right, a clear path to full equity partnership. I'm a believer that this is a huge part that allowed us to become the biggest ENT practice in the country is is because there's a clear path to full equity partnership. So there's no like carrot that's being dangled out in front of you that like you might get. Yeah, fine. You're a founding partner. You took financial risk. You took out loans. You did all this to build the practice that has worth. You have to decide what that value is and then give them an opportunity and a choice that whether or not they want to be a part of that and be maybe on equal standing, maybe not on equal standing, but something where they do have autonomy, a leadership position, some stake in it. Absolutely. And to just go back to one small part of what you said is that clear path that you have to partnership. You know, unfortunately, what has happened to some physicians is they'll go in being told they'll work towards partnership, but there's no clear cut way of attaining partnership. And then It just never happens. Yeah. So, you know, that's important for both the employee and the employer to look at when you're deciding whether to work together is know exactly what you want and make sure you're very clear about how you're going to get there. Yeah. I've heard that so many times from other friends joining other practices where they've said, yeah, you'll be called partner in name. This is what it means to be a partner, but this is the leadership structure and you're never going to be a part of that. This is who owns the majority stake, and there's no way you're going to ever own anything close to that. We're going to call you a partner, but it's not really a partner. It's a, still at some level of associate. So yeah, I totally agree with your sentiments here that you need to assess wh- what that value is of all the work and all the risk you took and give them an opportunity to get there. Not just this. Exactly. Then they get just wrapped up in, oh, you know, maybe in a couple of years, you'll maybe in a, maybe in a, and then you know what? They're going to resent you for that and they're going to leave. Exactly. How expensive is it to recruit a new physician into your practice? How time consuming, expensive, and then all that lost time of patients that weren't being seen bringing in more revenue. So yeah, 
Got to make it appealing. Got to make it appealing. Mm -hmm. And if you're not going to offer a partnership, that's okay. No, disagree. Not okay. Not okay. (laughs) Not okay. (laughs) Some doctors don't want partnership. So in that situation, you want to attract the person who does not want partnership. You don't want to falsely promise something you can't give. And so the high ROI, so that's a big ask to give up some of the partnership, but just to reiterate some of the high return on investment things that you suggested, something like a scribe, right? Where it's not very expensive, but it's going to really impact their quality of life and maybe even allow them to see more patients and bring in more revenue. And then the call service overnight will take away some of the pain. And another great thing, again, with my practice, I usually don't talk this much about my practice, (laughs) but you're talking about recruiting into private practice and we're awesome, is when you can schedule appointments online. When that happened in my practice, at least for me personally, my call volume dropped for like overnight emergency calls because they just went on their phone app and were like, oh, great. I can be seen tomorrow at two o'clock. Great. Okay. Now I can go to sleep knowing that whatever it is that I've got going on right now, I've got this appointment in my pocket. So now I don't have to call in the middle of the night with an emergency. So just for those practices out there, get online, get some way of having those appointments to be made online as well. Yeah, that's huge. There's so many little things that can be done and you can earn it back in money. Yep, invest in the practice. Okay, so as a candidate, how do we know that we're going to change hats? We're a candidate now. So how do we know if a job is a good fit? What are some of the things that I'm I'm looking for? Because especially when you're interviewing, it's hard to tell. Someone might be really good at making a first impression and then they're just a terrible person. So how do I take a peek under the hood? What am I looking for? There's a few things. So what's right for you may not be right for me. So the very first thing you want to do is before you even start interviewing is really just sit down, get rid of any distractions, put your phone away, make a list of all the things that are important to you. You know, the obvious ones are location and all that, but looking at a practice directly. So you want to think sometimes size of practice is important. Sometimes who is in the practice is important. There are certain, you know, practices that put a lot of effort and emphasis on diversity. So if that's something that's important to you, you want someone that matches with that belief. During the interview itself, really get down and ask those hard questions. Any question that is important to you, make sure you ask the question and make sure you ask it of more than one person. So if you're interviewing with a practice that has five physicians, you want to interview with at least two and bonus points. If you can speak with another one, just away from everyone else and just say, Hey, I just want to get a feel for what it's like working here to get a true sense of what it is. And sometimes you can ask the same question to multiple different people and see if you get the same answer, because if you're getting lots of different answers for something that's really important and some of the answers are great and some of the answers aren't so great. You really want to dig into that a little bit. You want to look at why the position is open. So are they growing? Well, that's generally a good thing. Is it because someone left? So that can be good if they left because they were at retirement age and it was just time for them to retire. That means you get a whole bunch of great patients, hopefully great. And in that case, you want to know what their practice style was, because if you're going to be inheriting those patients, you don't want it to be patients who, you know, a lot of younger physicians don't prefer to prescribe a lot of controlled substances. And the older physicians tend to have patients on more controlled substances. So that comes up not uncommonly. If it's someone who left two years into joining the practice, then you want to look into that a little bit more. Would it be out of line to find out their contact information and get in touch with them. So if there was someone that recently left the practice, the reason I bring that up is because that's actually something that I did when I joined my practice. (laughs) I got in touch with two people who had recently left. And as it turns out, one of them ended up coming back. So to find out why they left and what they thought, you know, get a a more objective measure. But I don't know if every situation that's going to be an okay thing to ask for. It is something that I have done as well. I think it's reasonable. You can always ask. The worst they can say is no. I don't think it's an unfair question to ask at all. And of course, you know, keep in mind that different people will think different things. So what's a deal breaker to you may not be a deal breaker to me. So really find out if they left because there was a change of administration that made things unpleasant, or there was an employee that made things difficult for them, you want to look into that a little bit more because 
you don't know what really happened. They may tell you their story. You know, there's always three sides to every story. But if every physician in Texas left, well, that's a little bit of a red flag, isn't it? So... <laughs> So when it comes to larger practices, sometimes they're almost like larger institutions in that they have this take it or leave it contract. So in that situation, what are some of the concessions that you've seen made where it seems like take it or leave it, but in the end, that wasn't exactly the case. You were able to negotiate some. So what were some of the concessions you've seen? It varies so wildly. So in the big systems, like the big hospitals where they say it's take it or leave it, Sometimes it is take it or leave it. And sometimes it's really not. You often can't negotiate, even if they say you can't negotiate. And there's a lot that goes into that. If you're in a specialty where there's a whole bunch of you guys and there's nurse practitioners that can do the same job. I say that in air quotes. For those listeners who are not watching the YouTube channel, there were air quotes. They were there. Yes. I should say the perception of doing the same job to administration it's a lot harder to negotiate. But if you're in a specialty where an example would be oculoplastics, there aren't exactly a lot of oculoplastic surgeons around. So you have a little bit more wiggle room there. So always you want to tell them what you bring to the table. The big physician owned groups, it varies. A lot of us in medicine are, well, I went through this, so you need to go through it. That's a hard barrier to push through, but certainly if you're excited to come to the practice and you come to them and say something like, this is what I bring to the table. This is what I offer you. This is how I can benefit your organization. I love training on information technology, or I notice you don't have any social media presence. I'd love to help you with that. There's a lot you can bring to the table and say, but you know, this, whatever it is, the non-compete is not okay with me. Typically, I work with the smaller practices. So there's always wiggle room in the smaller practices, but you can negotiate anything. The worst they can say is no, so long as you have a respectful, kind, logical discussion with them. It should never get in the way of how things go with you as an employee, but always negotiate something that's unreasonable in your contract. Yeah, you're going to need to advocate for yourself from the beginning and throughout your time there. You're always going to need to advocate for yourself. So if you start out being very deferential, that might set the tone for the rest of your time there. Whereas if you feel comfortable knowing what you're worth, asking for what you're worth, knowing what's important to you and demanding that, that sets the tone for your employment. Exactly. If they feel like they can walk over you from before you even start working there, they're going to feel like that forever. It's a hard tide to turn. So now let's change hats again. Back to the employers, right? The physician practice owners out there. We're going to be speaking to them. So what are some of the common reasons why your clients have left their practices or in the same vein, not taken offers? Two very different questions. So physicians often leave because of burnout. Barring, of course, you know, moving for family or leaving to take care of a family member. When they leave the practice because of some sort of unhappiness, it's burnout. It's not having a voice. Sometimes change of administration where maybe you were happy before and things aren't going so well, or even just a change of employees within the practice where you're not able to have any say in how that goes. So that could be with a medical assistant who makes you get behind by an hour or two each day, or, you know, there's so many different things. And that goes back to autonomy, because if you don't have the option to get rid of them or move them to a place where they'd be better, you know, that medical assistant may be better as a receptionist. So that goes back to autonomy. Sometimes there's a little bit of a personality clash that happens, but those are the big ones. Those are why people leave. As far as why doctors don't take a contract, the big ones would be, I've had doctors decline interviews entirely because tail malpractice is not covered. I've had them decline interviews because there isn't enough paid time off. So those are probably the big ones. Before interviewing, they'll decline to even have an interview if the salary isn't high enough, if PTO isn't enough, and if the tail mill practice isn't included. So those are three big ones. Once an interview's already happened, then it all just comes down to, is it a good fit or is it not a good fit? Some things I've seen have been, they were interviewing and didn't realize that they'd have to supervise a nurse or a nurse practitioner. That's definitely something they should know before they join. I've seen someone ended up 
and this was both sides agreed that it wasn't a good fit, this physician wanted to do big things. He wanted to be on hospital administration and be chief medical officer. And this practice had actually pretty great leadership opportunities within their practice and within the hospital system, but it was a much smaller hospital. It was a community hospital rather than a big system. So that's typically why things tend to go awry. Usually it's very amicable, but the big ones, which are the salary PTO and tail mill practice insurance, that's like absolute deal breaker. Even when I say, hey, let me go back and speak with the practice owner and see if I can get them to wiggle a little bit. This is before they've met each other. At that point, they're gone. Yeah. Unsalvageable. Yeah. Okay. Do you have any parting words for both camps, right? Parting words for physicians looking to make the right match. We'll do that one first. For those physicians, keep an open mind, really take a look at the private practices. So usually doctors looking for a job will focus, very narrow focus on salary. Yes, salary may be higher in a hospital system and the smaller private practices won't advertise their salary when they put out a job ad. And it's because they know they can't advertise with the hospitals, but you're paying for the price of your happiness. This is the price of you being able to spend time with your kids, the price of you being able to be present with your kids. And, you know, burnout is really not fun. So really think about what that costs to you. Keep an open mind. Remember, you can always negotiate a lot easier with a practice. Really identify what's important to you before you even start embarking on the physician search, on a job search. And then parting words for those practice owners out there, other than keep the salary high and the uh, long tail malpractice insurance. Yeah, keep the tail. If you can keep the tail, it's huge. It's absolutely worth it. But yeah, as far as the practices go, I know a lot of practices have a hard time finding their physicians. They're out there. There's always somewhere out there. There's people that can help. I'd love to help you find someone, but there's always ways to find a physician. There's ways to entice them and to show them how great you are, even if it's just something as simple as a scribe. Dr. Lara Hockman, thanks so much for your time. So where can people find you? My website is www.happydayhealth.co. I live on LinkedIn. I'm Lara Hockman, MD on LinkedIn. Those are the two easiest places. I'm on TikTok. I'm Happy Day MD. Wait, sorry. <laughs> so what, what, what do you, because I'm not on TikTok. You know, I sent you my press kit and it says, and I probably never will be. What do you post on TikTok? <laughs> Whatever I feel like at that day. So some days I will, for those that have been on TikTok, you'll know what I'm talking about. For people who aren't on TikTok, there's all these fun sounds and then you mouth the words to the song. I typically tend to find, you know, post something stupid about doctors choosing hospitals or doctors being burned out. Sometimes I'll post something actually educational. I posted something on what you should make your resume look like. And I posted talking about commute and I talk about anything job related for physicians and what to look for. But for the most part, it's just having fun with what's going on in healthcare these days. And so I've heard you say that the answer to burnout is private practice, which is, you know, it's not the only answer to burnout, but surrounding yourself with people who are living the same life as you going through what you go encountering the same problems as you, you know, in a practice that you have the autonomy and you're all trying to meet the same goals together, that type of camaraderie and having them care about you and your well-being. Clearly, I'm trying to sell people on private practice too, because I'm living it and loving it. I love what you're doing out there. So Dr. Lyra Hockman, thanks so much for your time. Thank you for having me. That was Dr. Bradley Block at the Physician's Guide to Doctoring. He can be found at physiciansguidetodoctoring.com or wherever you get your podcasts. If you have a question for a previous guest or have an idea for a future episode, send a comment on the webpage. Also, please be sure to leave a five-star review on your preferred podcast platform. We'll see you next time on the Physician's Guide to Doctoring.